of discourse. And um, that's going to be in direct clash to what they said. Because what I said is, when you're in massive pain and you're thinking about whether or not you need to end your life, it doesn't matter what the religious organization said. It doesn't matter what the popular discourse said. They were talking about discourse in terms of convincing the public whether or not we want to do this or that. I'm talking about discourse in terms of when the individual decides how to evaluate their own pain, that they're the best actor to evaluate their pain, and these fictitious religious organizations uh, aren't a part of that at 3 a.m. They're just not. Um, I'm going to bring you a couple arguments. I'm uh, going to tell you how this is an insult to those who are dying, to tell them that their lives are worthless, and they should hurry up and get off the planet. I'm going to tell you about the effect on families when you tell them that they should convince their loved ones to die. And I'm going to tell you about how, oftentimes, the decision to uh, do euthanasia on a family member is an inherently selfish one, because you don't want to see them suffer anymore, and how this plays into those existing biases, and how that is extremely, extremely dangerous. But I'm going to do this uh, by telling you a story. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my dad. Uh, who died almost one year ago from brain cancer. Um, I don't think he would have wanted to die, and I don't think he would have had wanted to be told that he should die. Uh, he slowly lost his ability to count. He couldn't see blue, so to him the sky was white. He couldn't remember names, so he would call me Mr. Man because he couldn't remember what my name was. But this experience was his experience. This experience was one that he was proud of. He wouldn't complain about the pain because he was proud that he could bear the pain. He didn't care that he wasn't who he used to be. He didn't care that he wasn't as smart as he used to be, that he couldn't remember things that he used to be able to remember. And to go on TV late at night when that was the only thing that he could do to entertain himself is to watch TV for hours because he was paralyzed from the waist down because the motor function in his brain didn't work anymore. You see an advertisement on TV saying, euthanasia is great, people like you should die. That's what would be best for you, would have been an insult to all of his bravery, to all of his suffering, to everything that he went through and he bore. And they don't care about any of that. All they care about is euthanasia is good. Good for who? Under what calculus is euthanasia good? Isn't that for the individual to decide when euthanasia is good? That's why I ask, if euthanasia is so good, if all these people should hurry up and die, and that's what's best for them, then don't kill them yourself. That's what I said in the POI. The fact that we don't kill them ourselves shows that the people who can evaluate when it's best to die or to live are the people suffering, not some arbitrary group that says euthanasia is good. We need to do euthanasia. Sit down. But furthermore, we don't think that you should put the burden on family members to say you should be, it's your moral duty to convince your loved ones to die. Euthanasia is good. Every second that you spend not convincing your suffering father to pass away is a moment that you're committing an immoral act because you're increasing his suffering. I don't think that's something we should say to children. I don't think that's something we should say to parents of terminally ill children. I don't think we should tell them that their uh, relations in terms of life and death to their family members are arbitrated by some outside morality, um, by some other actor that can decide better than them how to interact with their family members, better than them what is good for the people that they live every day with, whose suffering they see on a daily basis, whose suffering they know, who they have sat up with at 3 a.m. as they throw up in the toilet, who they have cleaned up after, after they shit everywhere because they can't control their bowel movements. I don't think, no thank you, I don't think an outside actor is better placed than the families in the houses to say whether or not that person's life is valuable or whether or not that person should die or should live and it's fundamentally so, insulting for them to say that yes please have it obviously some other people should glorify your father's effort to live but what happens to social recognition for those who couldn't resist other than blaming and what we say is that the individual is better able to arbitrate whether or not their suffering is serious enough to pass away. The person feeling the suffering knows better than anyone how much it hurts. The person feeling the pain knows better than anyone how difficult it is to bear that pain. So they should be the one to choose whether or not that pain is worth it or not. Whether or not living another day is worth it or not. Because they're the ones who feel that pain. You can't feel that pain. You can't say your pain is so bad you need to die. 
They're the ones who know whether or not that pain is serious enough. And if you've ever actually felt pain, if you've actually been in a state of constant suffering, you don't care about what society thinks. That's not relevant to your decision making in your body in that time. You're the one who knows what you need to do. But a further danger of this is we actually think family members have a bias towards euthanasia. When my dad was in the final weeks of his life, even though euthanasia is illegal in America, uh, I seriously contemplated stealing the morphine tablets from the cabinet in the hospital and feeding them to him until he died. I wanted to do that for selfish reasons. I wanted to do that because I didn't want to see him suffer anymore, and I didn't want my little brothers to see him suffer anymore. I wanted to stop the pain to us. I wanted to stop the pain to my family. I wasn't necessarily thinking about my dad in that circumstance. And I think that that bias exists in families of all kinds of suffering people. I'm sure anyone in this audience who has had a family member go through, go through this knows what I'm talking about, and when you do, you will understand. And we say it's really dangerous when these biases exist to tell people, oh, this is a good thing. This is something you should do. Go ahead and do it. It's what's best for them. Go ahead and do it now. Because it plays into this already existing dangerous bias where people don't want to see their, their parents suffer because it hurts. They don't want to see their children suffer because it hurts. And so their calculus isn't necessarily about the person. Their calculus is about how much it hurts me to watch them go through this. And this sort of policy exactly plays into that bias into the desire to not have to feel that pain anymore, to not have to feel the pain of watching them die. And so what we've brought here today is very simple. We shouldn't subject brave people to statements saying that they should hurry up and disappear. We shouldn't make children, we shouldn't tell children what the correct thing to do in terms of killing their parents is. And we shouldn't play into these existing biases. For all those reasons, we're very proud to propose. Thank you. I think in both situations, there are people who are going to commit euthanasia. Well, maybe the number might be different, but I think that both sides have to, have to bear that there is an existence of euthanasia in both paradigm in some countries. But what we have to recognize, as the closing government I have told us, look, th there are some people who want to escape from pain. There are people who want to die with dignity, and those people did not want to die like a vegetable people. We agree with that. But what we have to recognize is that when, at the point, no one glorifies this action of use in India, when everyone starts to blame that your choice was not a good thing, your choice was actually not something that degrades the dignity, you have actually run away from the harm that was imposed, and you are not actually a strong person anymore, Mr. Speaker. We think that is not how the state should face the choice. We don't think the state should make people regret the choice they have made. We don't think that certain choices state allow should be sanctioned by the society, especially when dignity, like euthanasia, is called something and death and dignity, when social recognition and how the people feel is extremely important. We think this social recognition should not be persuaded right, into one way to say your choice of something deemed wrong and those people should not be right, demonized. <laughs> I'm going to talk about two things in my speech. Firstly, I'm going to argue, talk about the dis discourse. discourse. I'm, I'm going to focus on the context of what kind of youth needs, how the youth needs have been treated in the international society, and what we think, especially glorification, <laughs> is something important. Second, I'm going to talk about given that youth in India is something that is clearly Related to the social recognition, how the people treat dignity, how people understand dignity, while we think glorification of the certain choices is extremely important for those people to make choices, choices, but not to make those people regret what kind of choices they have made. Before so, that, no thank you. Uh, the rebuttals. So, firstly, 
Remember the government told us this is very beautiful uh, speeches. I was impressed by it, but since it's a debate, I have to watch the really to it. So, <laughs> what they have told us is, unfortunately, it was nothing about the motion itself, right? He was talking about this family making a choices and other people should not go in. But this debate argument is not about banning glorification or at least a one-sided opinion, but this argument was about banning a certain influence made within the public sphere, right? This motion is not about banning a certain influence made within the public sphere to begin with. But secondly, if, Point of if, if, no? if the closing governments are worried about this like, glorification, a glorified expression go inside the houses, we think that even in the time, same things are actually going to still happen, right? Because in their paradigm, negative depiction of euthanasia still exists. Which means in those houses, there's the people who say, look, you should not die, right? That is something horrible to do, do right? And that means those people's like, house Point of information, and personal right? choices, we don't think the harm is mutually exclusive. No, sit down. So, first extension. Idea about this, like, marriage and river within, right, during, during a whole <coughs> But firstly, so, they have to tell us why this goes, it, the opening government's burden to say why we have to ban this. I think the way they try to say that we have to ban this is because our discourse are going to be swayed by the liberals, right? Without telling any logic why liberals are going to have like, a power, power over the conservative who are still going to claim, look, this is dignity, is something wrong, euthanasia is a bad thing. And especially the context, Mr. Speaker, when we think about euthanasia, right? There has been a number of the choices, Mr. Speaker, for example, abortion, for example, any kind of tobacco, alcohol, which was something controversial, but that is spreading throughout the societies, right? But we have to realize the reason why euthanasia was not actually spreading this in the society, that still, even in the current situation where only Small number of countries that legalize that controversial choice, which we believe the reason is because we think even in the current situation there has been a dominance of the voices of the conservatives, religious conservatives, and ethnic conservatives, <laughs> any kind of the region was opposing to that is my euthanasia, and we think in the past it was immoral to claim that euthanasia may be a good thing. We think it is a good thing that these like liberal, like maritime liberals started to claim that look, this choice may be a good thing, right? Because this is the only time when this like a power of the liberals and power of the conservative has started to grow at the equal level and have a healthy discussion. That is the reason why some countries started to legalize euthanasia and that is a good thing, right? Because we have seen like a true disparity of the power between conservative and liberals, and we think, especially regarding the context of euthanasia, the reason why yeah, right. euthanasia has not been and still not legalized in many countries, right, which is different from other right, controversial choices, was because this voice of the conservative was extremely strong. We have to focus on the context of euthanasia, <laughs> and we think this group of voices is extremely important to make people discuss. This is something very important to note it down. Second extension. So, Mr. Speaker, about about why we think the social recognition is important. So, in the context where euthanasia is in the debate, we think people who is a, who is the target of the debate is the people who are more likely to soon, unfortunately, die. Those people suffer from massive pain, started to lose control of their bodies, they started to lose their dignity as a human being. Some people like have to like, cannot stop to show the humiliation of their body to other people. Some people may have to lose hairs, um, no addition to anyone. And, Self urine may not be conducted by itself. Like self bowl also may not be conducted by themselves. And those people may like be a human vegetable, and they are going to start well, their right. their yeah. dignity, right? We think this is going to be harmful. And people sometimes have to like show the extremely dirty body for the public, and, and they will have to show the humiliation that they are not prison anymore, and they are very sad vegetable. Then. This is where the choices are going to come in. Those people are going to make a choices so, before whether I should actually conduct these choices as to protect my dignity, to actually live as a healthy person and escape from the slavery of pains that is being posed on individuals without having any consent. But Mr. Speaker, we have to recognize when there is the idea that dignity to be whole, when the society, when the state have registered that you are allowed to hold your dignity in order to die. We have to recognize social recognition is something extremely important, especially in the context of euthanasia, Mr. Speaker. Because if the people does not think, I think what's going to happen in the power line, if the people does not regard those deaths as dignity, if the people regard those deaths as that you have actually escaped from a pain and you're not a strong person anymore, then that person has to think that, that I point. am not going to be glorified my death, no one actually is going to admit my dignity, and no one actually going to my, admit my choices, to live as a healthy person, as the usual people. Information. Ah, uh, so, closing. Ah, uh, closing. Yeah. Do you really think someone's going to stand up at the funeral of a cancer patient and go, he had no dignity, he ran away? Well, that's what they are doing, right? For example, if the first, for example, let's think about the family then first. If, the, if there was a family whose husband actually died with euthanasia, well, the discourse that families are going to face in their power line is all the negative implication of the euthanasia. Everyone in the internet, everyone on TV, everyone on Andrew are only allowed to make a certain, certain like a demonization of euthanasia saying that your father had made a wrong choice. It was not with the dignity. Your father had run away from the pain and those families are going to feel a massive discomfort, a massive sorrow. And also, you have to realize, 
that when the person thinks that they are actually going to contact you in India, they also have to regret their choices, even if they try to make the choice. Maybe those people have forced actually to make a youth in India in both the paradigm have to have, have to realize those people have to make the choices, but not in a happy way. Those people have to regret the choice they have made because they know that society is not going to praise them. Society is actually going to demonize their action by saying you have escaped from the pain and it was the wrong thing. To do. We think, given that both situation where a certain choice exists, we think it is immoral for the state to make people regret the bad choices that they are going to make. We think it is wrong to make a social recognition going to demonize those people, especially when dignity is not going to be constructed by one individual, but going to be constructed by society. We think that is important to glorify. That's why we're here. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, three points of clarification before starting my speech. First of all, we concede there are a lot of discourse in dialogue on that side of the house when they have a lot of information. But the problem here, or standard from the side of the house, is why that discourse happens at the expense of sacrificing the instigation of the harm to the most vulnerable people. We don't believe that's a fair priority in the debate first place, right? I don't think the most relevant stakeholders are benefiting from those discussions in the first place. The kind of the wider range of discourse that they want to guarantee is unduly sacrificing the most relevant, vulnerable stakeholders in the euthanasia. And that's the point and that, that's the point of priority that we are making in the debate. But second of all, we are more than happy to engage different types of context in a jurisdiction in which there's a political debate about whether to legalize or not, or in a jurisdiction in which euthanasia is already accepted. In any jurisdiction, we believe this kind of expression is a particular Deleterious and pernicious, that's why we are happy to engage in any circumstances. Third of all, throughout the four speakers from the opposition bench, they seem to have been talking about whether euthanasia is good or bad. That's not a debate. We're talking about the effect over the decision making process of individuals who are directly involved in this particular yeah. medical practices. That's what my partner extended in his speech. Three points. Uh, let me summarize or compare the arguments from aspects of three uh, persons, uh, three aspects. First of all, those who are directly involved in the euthanasia, the most valuable people, those who are complete, uh, thinking of uh, committing euthanasia. Second of all, the aspect of the surrounding people, who are the family or those surrounding people, uh, or those who are complaining, com uh, uh, thinking to commit euthanasia. Third of all, the perception and bias of society. No, that I'll take you later. <coughs> the first of all, the most vulnerable people who are directly involved in the circumstances in which he or she wants to opt in or opt out. Mr. Speaker, what Tom extended is very unfair that these vulnerable individuals are disproportionately offended when they face this particular information. We can see debate may happen under your side of the house, but what's the justification yeah. to further penalize, they punish, and most vulnerable people who are already suffer a lot even in the status quo? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. We believe on this side of the house. State has a duty not to, uh, state should not allow random third party to make an expression which already yeah. insult or harm the most relevant and vulnerable stakeholder, which is different from objective information, which is different from documentary or TV or whatever objective newspaper, <laughs> because that kind of discourse does not instigate disproportionate psychological harm on the most valuable, relevant, weak stakeholders within the circumstances in which they are trying to like uh, make a large decision. No, thank you. In exactly the same extent, with the state or uh, already already regulated or banned the expression that promotes or glorifies suicide for the hate speech or blasphemous expression because those kinds of unnecessary glorification instigates the disproportionate harm upon the individuals who are most vulnerable that deserve state legal protection. Now I believe the body is necessary a uh, regulation or legal framework we would like to uphold in debate. Uh, no closing, no. Given that in those paradigm people commit euthanasia anyway, why do you think it is a good thing to impose more punishment to a self and family by social demonization and say your choice was wrong? We don't demonize them, Mr. Speaker. We ban the expression that glorifies euthanasia. It's not necessarily the reverse consequence that we, we don't we are not talking about the expression that demonizes who otherwise don't make certain choices. That's a totally different thing. There's a certain moral dilemma between you should euthanize their family, or you should not euthanize their family. Right. There's certain different uh, the right. level of coerciveness or level of effects over the decision making process is totally different between demonization of a certain act and the glorification of a certain act. You have to recognize the difference. Right. No, 
because you guys are talking a very generic debate about the public discourse without explaining explaining the specific analysis on the euthanasia. That's why I'm not re I'm not like to take your question. Yeah. Okay, if you want. Okay, I just like this. <laughs> <laughs> you said that this discourse is going to harm the most vulnerable people, but Thomas said that people who are vulnerable and choose euthanasia don't care about discourse. No, 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 why? no, no. He read the face the expression directly in any occasion, they are harm, right? They don't consider whether like other random third party who have nothing to do with euthanasia will care this person or not, but he himself is overly affected or ins insulted or offended by this particular information. That's why they deserve state protection, state is duty to protect these vulnerable people rather than prioritize the unfuzzy consequences of the discourse. Because we can't see the consequences of the discourses under your side of the house. They are never they, the none of the speaker concluded the debate completely the consequences of the having loads of discourses with random types of information. The second of all, the most relevant stakeholder in the debate is the surrounding people. It's extremely dangerous that these surrounding people or family are you know, uh, exposed by this particular type of information. Again, let's compare, right? We can see a lot, like some kinds of, you know, uh, people are held under your side of the house, like li limited number of like religious believer who are overly brainwashed by some uh, like a uh, coercive doctrine or something, right? But I don't think that's the reason to justify the harm for the overwhelming majority of the stakeholders in the debate, the surrounding people, or those who actually committed the suicide in the past, or those who are thinking to commit uh, euthanasia in the near future. The vast majority of those people are under the threat under your brother. In terms of number, we are happy to defend, uh, defend the benefit and utility for the larger number of people on the basis of this kind of analysis either, and we can uh, win the debate. The final, finally, Mr. Speaker, it's very dangerous because it exacerbates pre-existing uh, bias within a society where the euthanasia is already legalized or already accepted by a public. Because people believe that euthanasia is something good as they characterize. If people have already like captured by the preconception, it's dangerous because those a glorification will make them further rush to the options and that further unnecessarily encourage those individuals to uh, rush to this option. They say social recognition is important, but what sort of social recognition is important should be explained by that side of the house. We don't need social recognition that overwhelmingly encourage people unnecessarily to rush to this option. If that's social recognition that they are defended, we don't think that is a beneficial social recognition that, uh, that, can, that, that they can achieve on their side of the house. We already, Mr. Speaker, as they explain, as we explain, the medical the community have been efforts to you know make people, make the patients make a rational decision by giving them information like informed consent. In exception of that, we have to discourage people to make a casual, uh, irrational options uh, decisions as much as possible. In extension of those current legal frameworks, we are more than happy to regulate and bound this information, which and unnecessarily encourage people to you know rush this option. So for all the basic reasons, all the benefit with that cyber house stands at the expense of the most vulnerable people that deserve state protection. We believe it's more imperative of the state to prioritize the interests of those disenfranchised populations over those who already benefit under your cyber house. Thank you. How social recognition of euthanasia occurs, and how discussion occurs. Secondly, how is the body of euthanasia understood? How people will be able to recognize both those who struggle to live and both those who sought for dignified death. Under our paradigm, both is possible. Under their paradigm, only the one, only one is possible, and our paradigm is better. So firstly, how social recognition occurs. Toshi said in, in, in his Prime Minister's speech, pressurization by liberals is prone. I've seen, uh, I, I, I've seen as euthanasia is like, uh, euthanasia is like, uh, 
glorified that everyone gets in connection towards euthanasia. There are two responses. Firstly, if you care about pressurization, let others express whatever intuitive to devalue euthanasia in the first place. Let them show bad, bad images of euthanasia. Like, wait, that's what some of some of conservatives are doing, even in their private, right? Some might some might use like religious labeling, for example, to of sinners for sweeping generalization in their product, right? They say, hey, euthanasia is against God's conscious for life. Uh, not all, but some people anyway do this. We think that their paradigm, this expression still exists. And the, the same response goes to the closing government as well. Later. 